Hello, everybody. Welcome to lecture number 15. Today, we're going to begin chapter 24, which deals with fluid, electrolyte, and acid base balance. We are going to get through um, fluid and electrolyte portion of this chapter. And then we will, on the next chapter, or the next lecture, rather, we'll get to the acid base balance. So let's uh, let's jump right in. This is a uh, not too bad of a chapter as far as length goes. Okay, so let's start it up. So cellular function requires a fluid medium with a carefully controlled composition. Okay, so three types of homeostatic balances that we have are fluid balances. We need to have those um, in a stable internal condition. That's what homeostasis means, right? A stable internal condition. So we need our fluid um, levels to be balanced in a homeostatic way. We need our electrolytes to be balanced in a homeostatic way. And we need the acids and bases in our system to be uh, in a homeostatic balance as well. We don't want any one of these to be too much or too few because uh, it can harm our body from performing the way it needs to perform. Okay, balances maintained by collective action of the urinary system, the reproductive system, the digestive, the integumentary, the endocrine, the nervous, the cardiovascular, and the lymphatic systems. All of these systems are going to help keep those three um, types of homeostatic balance uh, in the proper uh, order in the proper balance, for lack of a better word. Okay. So the body water percentage uh, is going to vary from person to person, and it's going to vary from um, age to age. Okay. A newborn baby's body weight is about 75% water, which is most of that, most of that baby. Young men average around 55% to 60% water. Women average slightly less, and that is due to um, adipose tissue. Uh, nearly being free of water. Uh, women have um, more body fat than men do on average. Uh, the obese and elderly people uh, have as little as 45% uh, water by weight. Okay, And total body water, which is TBW, we're going to see that uh, abbreviation uh, in future slides. So know that TBW stands for total body water. Of, self 70, of a 70 kilogram young male, is about 40 liters and 70 grams is a, a man roughly about 150 pounds. Uh, 40 liters of that um, is, is the amount of water in that particular individual. Okay, major uh, fluid compartments of the body. Okay, so there are two major fluid compartments of the body. You have intracellular fluid or ICF. You're gonna see these two abbreviations all over this PowerPoint. Okay, so 65% of your fluids are held in your intracellular fluid compartments, which is inside of your cells, okay, within the cell membranes of your cells, okay, in your cytoplasm. 35% of your um, fluids in your body are going to be extracellular fluids, which are in between cells, right? So intracellular fluids are fluids that are held within your cells. Extracellular fluids are fluids held outside of your cells. So if we take that 35% of extracellular fluid and we can break that down even more into other percentages, so 25% of that 35% is going to be fluid that's in your tissues, okay? And we call the, the fluid that's in your tissues interstitial fluid, okay? 8% of that 35% of extra, extracellular fluid is going to be your blood plasma and your lymphatic fluids. 2% of that 35% of your extracellular fluid is going to be what we call a catch-all category. So we can find that in our central um, nervous system. We can find it in our synovial uh, joints and synovial cavities uh, in between our joints, our peritoneal cavities, the pleural cavities that surround our organs, pericardial fluids, which surround our abdomen, uh, the, our heart rather, okay, the pleural cavity, which is on our, our lungs and our, you know, our thorax. Okay, peritoneal, which is on our abdomen. Okay, these are places we can find transcellular fluids. Okay, which are uh, this catch-all category, which kind of encompasses everywhere but your tissues and your blood plasma. Okay. Um, also, we can find transcellular fluid in our eyes. Okay, if you ever dissect an eye, if you had the opportunity to dissect an eyeball, okay, you'll find that there are two different types of liquid mediums in an eyeball. We have the vitreous and aqueous humor. Okay, those are going to be the um, the liquids that are within the major cavity of the eye um, and the anterior and posterior chambers of the eye. 
okay? Uh, fluids of the digestive system, okay, which um, are going to be like water, um, different hormones, um, things like that. Uh, the, uh, liquids or fluids of the urinary system, which are going to be nitrogen wastes as well as water and salts and things like that, and water of the reproductive tracts as well. Okay, so that's where that transcellular fluid is going to be coming from. Okay, fluid is continually exchanged between these compartments. Okay, so um, fluids are constantly going into and out of your cells is basically what that means. Okay, intracellular and extracellular osmolarity are equal. Um, what osmolarity is, I'm going to get into it more later, but it's basically the amount of dissolved things in your blood or in your, uh, in your fluids. Okay. Um, because water moves easily through membranes, osmotic gradients never last very long. So um, what an osmotic gradient is, it's basically when you have a higher concentration of uh, water on one side of a cell or outside the cell than you do inside the cell, typically what happens is that you have movement of water from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. Typically, this what, what this is saying is that that typically doesn't last very long. When you have more water on the outside, it'll move in, and then that gradient will change, and you'll have more water on the inside than you will on the outside, and it will move out. So there's always this flow of water into and out of your cell's membranes because of osmotic gradients changing. If imbalances do arise, Okay, if you do have uh, instances where um, the concentrations are out of balance, osmosis will try to help restore that balance very quickly. Okay, if osmolarity of the tissue fluids rises, water can move out of the cell. Okay, if it falls, water will move into the cell. Okay, and that's your body's way of correcting the imbalance that is being made. And we'll talk about more about imbalances later on. Okay, osmosis uh, from one fluid compartment to another is determined by the relative concentrations of solutes in each compartment. So like I was saying before, you know, if you have a higher concentration of something uh, in one place and a lesser concentration of something in another place, typically in science, what tends to happen is that things move from where they are greatest to where they are least, okay? Um, most solute particles, a solute is something that's dissolved in water, right? So something that could be a solute, some things that we can talk about that are solutes are things like salts. Okay, sodium is a type of salt. Uh, we find sodium a lot in extracellular fluid. Okay, and depending on the salt concentration that you have, will kind of determine uh, how fluid is going to move into and out of cells. That's what this is saying. Um, in your intercellular fluid, okay, potassium salts are uh, high in solute particles. Okay, so uh, the potassium salts will also help determine uh, how fluid moves between one. Uh, in another compartment. Electrolytes, okay, uh, electrolytes basically are salts, so sodium and potassium are electrolytes. Okay, electrolytes play the principal role in governing the body's water distribution and total water content. Okay, so if you have electrolyte imbalances, that is going to mess around with how water is uh, distributed in the body and how much water your body retains or how much water your body will rid of itself. Okay. So here's just, you know, a graphic image of, you know, ladies drinking some water, okay, it gets into our digestive tract, from there it gets absorbed into our bloodstream, from the bloodstream it gets, uh, you know, diffuses into your, your cells and your tissues, from your tissues it has to get cleaned up by your lymphatic system, and then your lymphatic system, after it cleans it up, puts it back into the bloodstream, and this is a uh, fairly, you know, this is the, the normal way in which water gets processed uh, around the body pretty much. Okay, so water gains and losses. Let's talk about that. So um, fluid balance, uh, your daily gains and losses are about equal to 2,500 milliliters a day. Okay, so where do you get your gains from? Where do you gain water from? You gain water from uh, what we call performed water. Um, and that is the majority of the gains of your water uh, intake. And out of that 2,500, it's about 2,300 milliliters of your 2,500 uh, per day. And where does preformed water come from? Preformed water comes from the ingested food that you have, right? And the ingested um, water that you drink. Okay. So from the food that you eat, you get about 700 milliliters a day from the food that you eat. There is water in the food that you eat. Uh, you drink about 1600 milliliters a day 
uh, of water from from various things that you drink. It doesn't have to be strictly water, but most of the things that you drink are water based, right? Even alcohol is a water based liquid, right? Sodas are water based, um, soft drinks, um, sports drinks, things like that. Even coffees and teas, you make them with water, so you're drinking, you know, plenty of water a day. Okay, then there's metabolic water. Okay, metabolic water is about 200 milliliters a day, much, much less than the preformed water. And where we get metabolic water is formed from aerobic metabolism and dehydration synthesis in the body. So pretty much it's preformed means it's H2O before it gets into your body, right? It's, it's H2O chemically before you ingest it into your mouth and swallow it into your stomach. Okay, it's already water. That's the majority of the water that you gain on a daily basis. But your body also has the ability to make water itself. It's not preformed, right? That's why it's called preformed water. Um, metabolic water is water that's put together inside of the body, right? So it's, it starts off as glucose. It starts off as oxygen. And your body can take these things apart and rearrange them to get water molecules, to get H2O, right? It, it steals H's from, from glucose. It takes oxygen from the air you breathe. It kind of mixes them around, puts them together. You know, that, that, that's a really um, simplified version of cellular respiration. Um, but essentially, you make water with the oxygens that you breathe and the H's that you take from, from things like glucose and, and other electron carriers like NADH and things like that. Okay. Um, sensible water loss is very observable. Okay, so sensible water loss includes your um, water that you lose in your urine. Okay, about 1,500 milliliters a day is lost in urine. About 200 milliliters a day is lost in your feces. Okay, even though that is solid waste, there is plenty of moisture uh, in your feces. Okay, and it, again, it all depends on, on your body and, and your diet and your activities and things like that. We're just, this is the average. Okay, 100 milliliters a day uh, is going to be lost in uh, sweating in a resting adult. Even though you, you might not think that you're sweating very much, okay, you are releasing um, some sweat out of your pores, even if you are resting um, and not doing some type of uh, strenuous activity. And then we have insensible water loss, which goes pretty much unnoticed. You don't know that this is happening, right? Sensible water loss is observed, right? You can observe yourself urinating. You can observe um, you know, going to the bathroom, you can observe actual sweating, right? You can observe that stuff, but there's water that you're losing on a daily basis that you don't really notice because it's not, um, it's not as noticeable as these other things, right? And it's much less, right? If you add these up, what do you got? 17, 1800 milliliters a day of water loss. Okay. Here you have about 400 or 700, um, milliliters a day of unnoticed water loss and, and 300 mils of that will be in the breath that you expire or the breath that you breathe out. Okay, your, your lungs, your uh, trachea, your respiratory system is moist. It has water in it. And every time you breathe out, okay, there are water particles that leave your mouth. Um, there's something called cutaneous transpiration. And that's basically water evaporating from you um, due to the concentrations of water in the air and due to concentrations of water on your skin. Right? If you live in a very damp region, this number might be lower. Right? If you live in a place like Florida or if you live in a place that's um, very humid all the time, has 100%, 90% humidity all the time, um, you're going to transpire less. Okay? Uh, if you live in a dry area, you live in some place like uh, you know, Arizona or you know, Nevada where it's really dry, Okay, trans cutaneous transpiration is going to happen a lot more often to you because there's less moisture in the air, which means it's going to come for, it's going to get basically get pulled from your skin. Okay, um, this does not come from your sweat glands. This is basically just evaporation. It's like if you left a, sp a wet sponge outside in the in the sun, okay, that water is not going to boil out of the sponge necessarily, it's, but it's going to evaporate and dry out the sponge, and that's basically what happens to your um, epidermis. Okay, the water evaporates out of your epidermis. If your water concentration is higher than the air's concentration of water or moisture, okay? And again, this loss is going to vary greatly with the environment, which is what I was just talking about, and whatever activity you're doing. If you're not doing any activity, you're going you're gonna to lose less um, water 
uh, content than if you're, you know, doing some type of strenuous exercise in the heat where you're, you know, where you're sweating profusely or something like that. Okay. So here's just a graphic of typical gains and losses that you get uh, during the day. Okay. You have metabolic uh, water that you're drinking, that you're gaining. Okay. You have food where you get your water from. You have the actual drink. Okay. Where do you lose it? Your urine, your sweat, uh, cutaneous transpiration, expired air, and fecal matter. Okay. Thirst or the regulation of fluid intake um, is done by this feeling of, of thirst, this, this feeling that you need to drink something. Okay. And thirst mainly governs your fluid intake. When you feel thirsty, you, you go try to get a drink. And if you cannot find a drink, um, you, you try harder to get a drink, I guess, or try, you try to do something to quench that thirst, okay, which leads to dehydration. If you, if you can't get um, fluids to quench your thirst, you have run the risk of becoming dehydrated. Uh, what dehydration is or what dehydration does is it reduces your blood volume and it also reduces your blood pressure, okay? And when you become dehydrated, when you, re when you remove water from your blood, because that's, you know, you're going to reduce... That's why you're reducing your blood volume because you actually are going to absorb some of the water in your blood plasma to make up for the lack of water in your body. And that lack of uh, that reduction in volume of blood is going to reduce the pressure. OK, if you if you lose blood uh, due to some type of wound uh, and the blood is pouring out of your body, your blood pressure is drastically dropping because the, the blood needs to be there in order to keep the pressure high. Right, so if you reduce the amount of blood you have, or if you reduce the volume of your blood, you're going to reduce how much pressure is being produced by that blood. This is going to increase osmolarity. Okay, and here's the definition of osmolarity. Okay, it refers to the concentration of dissolved particles of chemicals and minerals, such as sodium and other electrolytes in your blood serum. High osmolarity means that you have more particles in your serum, and low osmolarity means that the particles are more diluted. Okay, so when when osmolarity increases, that's when you lose water. You lose water, you have more dissolved particles, okay? And when you have um, low osmolarity, that means you have low particles, or not even that, not even the particles are low in content. It's the same amount of particles, it's just that they're more diluted than others, right? So if you take, uh, I think I've used this uh, example once before, if you take a scoop of like um, Kool-Aid mix or a scoop of iced tea mix, some type of, you know, uh, drink mix and you take that scoop or, you know one full scoop and you put it into a you know a pitcher and you add a cup of water to it okay you have diluted the the powder if you put another cup of water in it you've diluted it even more if you put another cup you dilute it even more so think of that powder as being powder okay in the powder form as your dissolved particles right think of that as your salts and your potassiums and the things that are dissolved in your in your body's water the more water you have, the less of that granular stuff that you see at the bottom of the pitcher. And that is low osmolarity, right? You didn't decrease the amount of, of uh, powder that you have. You just increased the amount of water that you had, which makes the powder more diluted, okay? When you decrease the water, when you remove water, okay, you're going to see more of that um, more of that powder, right? If you, if you only add one cup, you see a lot of that powder that's not even dissolving because it doesn't have enough water to dissolve in. And that's what happens to your, to the fluid in your body. If you get rid of the fluid in your body for whatever reason, okay, due to dehydration, okay, the amount of salt isn't, it's not necessarily going up, but it's being, it's more noticeable, right? Because the water is leaving and what's, what's being left behind are these, are these solutes, which are these dissolved particles or once dissolved particles in your blood are less diluted. Okay, so dehydration is going to reduce your blood volume, right, which basically is taking water out of the pitcher, and that's going to increase your osmolarity. It's going to increase the amount of dissolved particles in your blood or in your uh, fluids, okay? So how do we regulate fluid intake, right? We regulate it with things like the hypothalamus. Okay, hypothalamus is a gland that's going to help, that has receptors, osmoreceptors, receptors that are going to help uh, osmosis. Uh, and it's going to respond to to blood pressure drops. It's going to respond to these low blood pressures due to dehydration, uh, and respond so that you can rise or raise the osmolarity of extracellular fluid. Okay, 
it's going to respond to a rise in osmolarity. It's not, it's not going to respond and rise. It's going to respond to the rise in osmolarity. Okay, so the hypothalamus is going to see that your blood pressure is dropping. It's going to see that water is leaving uh, or that you are lacking water because of a rise in osmolarity. Okay, and it's going to promote water conservation by producing antidiuretic hormone, which we talked about in the last chapter. Okay, antidiuretic hormone is going to promote reabsorption in the kidneys, right? So when your hypothalamus sees that your blood pressure is dropping and it sees that the sodium and potassium levels are, uh, or the osmolarity is, is going up, it's going to produce antidiuretic hormone so that your kidneys can absorb or reabsorb water and put it back into your system so that you're not as dehydrated. The cerebral cortex of your brain is the thing that produces the actual sense of thirst in you, okay? Um, intense sense of thirst with 2 to 3% increase in plasma osmolarity or a 10 to 15% loss of your blood, right? So when you have these numbers in osmolarity, if you have a 2 to 3% increase in your blood osmolarity or if you have a 10 to 15% drop in blood pressure, okay, that's going to produce a thirsty feeling um, from your brain, right? Your brain's going to tell you to drink something because it knows the only reason these numbers go up or these numbers go down is because you are dehydrated. And in order to stop you from being dehydrated, okay, your cerebral cortex is going to give you this dry mouth sensation. It's going to give you this, this thirstiness sensation so that you go and drink some water, okay? During these times, salivation is inhibited, okay? You don't want to, and that's what makes your mouth dry, Okay, the thing that, that keeps your mouth moist most of the time, most of the day, is that you are producing saliva from your salivary glands in your mouth. And if you are not producing saliva, that's what makes your mouth dry, right? So the cerebral cortex sees these increases or decreases in um, osmolarity or, or blood pressure, and it stops the salivation um, from being, it stops the saliva from being produced, which makes you thirsty, which hopefully gets you to to uh, go get a drink or something like that. It's, it's basically your body warning you that something's not right and that you have to go fix it. Okay, long-term inhibition of thirst. Okay, so absorption of water from the small intestine reduces the ob osmolarity of your blood, right? That makes a lot of sense. If you if you absorb water in your intestines, that's going to increase the amount of water that's, uh, that's in your body tissues, which is going to decrease your osmolarity. It's going to, to make the dissolved particles more diluted, okay? This will stop the uh, osmoreceptor response and promote capillary filtration and make saliva more abundant and watery, right? So this is how you fix the problem, right? We started the problem because we were dehydrated. Our hypothalamus is responding to this. It's um, producing antidiuretic hormone. The cerebral, uh, cerebral cortex is telling you to go drink something. And when you finally do that, Okay, this absorption of the water from your small intestines, from the reabsorption in your kidneys, from the drinking of the of the glass of water. Okay, this will stop that response. It will promote capillary filtration and it'll cause you to make saliva again. Okay. This change requires about 30 minutes or longer to take effect. Okay, so from dehydration to uh, to drinking that water to you know, having your kidneys reabsorb water for, from your intestines um, absorbing more water. Um, it takes about 30 minutes to get back to some type of normal hydration state. Okay, short-term inhibition of thirst. Okay, um, some things that you can do uh, quickly to try to help this, uh, this issue of dehydration. Okay, cooling and moistening of the mouth will help to qu quench your thirst. Okay, uh, distension of the stomach and small intestine will help that as well. Okay, so you know, eating something, putting something in your stomach. Okay, this will give you um, a short-term um, remedy for thirst, okay? This is not going to give you a long-term remedy for thirst. Uh, you need to, you know, drink a, a decent amount of water and, you know, uh, change your whatever activity is that you're doing so that you can become hydrated again. This short-term inhibition of thirst is only going to give you about 30 to 45 minutes of satisfaction from your thirst, okay? It must be followed by water being absorbed into the bloodstream. And when it, if it does not, okay, if, if once the water stops getting into the bloodstream or being absorbed back into the bloodstream, you're going to be thirsty again, okay? This uh, short-term response is designed to prevent overdrinking. You can overdrink water, okay? If you uh, 
there is there are certain things that you cannot get too much of. Fiber is one of those things, and water is, is one of those things. As long as you continuously urinate, if you uh, if you drink too much water and you prevent yourself from urinating, that is not a good thing. And we can get into that a little bit later. Okay, so here is another graphic of what happens during dehydration. So you have dehydration here, which is going to increase your blood osmolarity. It's going to reduce your blood pressure. Okay, the decrease or the increase in osmolarity is going to stimulate the hypothalamus in your brain. Okay, it's going to reduce the amount of saliva that you produce because saliva is made of water, so it doesn't want you to use that water. It wants you to keep that water because you're dehydrated, and it's going to make you thirsty. Go on the other side. If you have reduced blood pressure, that's going to stimulate the hypothalamus as well. It's going to reduce uh, salivation. Okay, it's going to give you the sense of thirst, this dry mouth sensation. Okay, what do you do? You ingest water. Okay, you can ingest water uh, to cool and moisten your mouth. You can ingest enough water to rehydrate your blood. You can ingest enough water to distend your stomach. Okay, that is going to, if you, if you drink just enough water to distend your stomach and intestines a little bit, that is going to be the short-term inhibition of thirst. But if you drink enough water, okay, uh, that, that might only be if you drink, you know, so let's say, you know, let's say you're this guy, right? And you're, you're walking along um, this, this desert, okay? And you come across uh, a little tiny puddle of water for some reason, and that's not a mirage. And you actually drink that little puddle of water. That's going to distend your stomach, distend your intestines, give you short-term inhibition of thirst, All right? It might only last a couple of minutes, okay? But if, let's say, you know, you are, um, you're rescued, okay? You, you find, a, you know, an outpost, you find, someone's house, you go into the house after a couple of days of not drinking and, you know, you drink, you know, over a couple of hours, you drink a gallon of water, that's going to be long-term inhibition of thirst and you're going to be rehydrated again eventually. Okay. Okay. So fluid output. Okay. Only way to control water output significantly is through variation of urine volume. Okay. This is stuff that we talked about in the urinary uh, chapter uh, last two lectures. Okay, kidneys cannot replace water or electrolytes, right? That's not what kidneys do. Kidneys do not make water. Kidneys do not produce electrolytes. Okay, but kidneys can slow down the rate of water and electrolyte loss until those electrolytes and water can be ingested, right? So your kidneys cannot produce more water and put it into your system, and it can't produce electrolytes, but the, the flow into the glomerulus or out of uh, or into the uh, PCT, which we talked about, the proximal convoluted tubule, that can be slowed down by the kidney. And why do we want to do that? If we slow that rate down, that gives the water more of a chance to be reabsorbed, right? So we don't want it too slow, because if we have it too slow, then you can reabsorb nitrogen waste and you don't want to do that. But we definitely want to slow it down a little bit. If, we, if it's too fast, then water won't get reabsorbed and that water ends up going to your bladder. So we want to slow it down a little bit. Okay, we don't want to, we don't want to slow it down too much to where we're putting waste back in our body, but we want to slow it down just enough uh, to kind of buy us some time, right? And your kidney can only do that for so long, right? Your kidney's doing that with the intention of, oh, he'll drink something in a little while or he'll, he or she will eat something in a little while and this will go back to homeostasis. If it doesn't do that for an extended period of time, then you can, you can eventually get kidney damage, okay? Um, some control mechanisms of water output changes in your urine volume are linked to the adjustments of sodium reabsorption. Okay, as sodium is reabsorbed or excreted, water will follow it. This is, this is why we say salt will retain water, okay? Sodium is one half of sodium chloride, which is salt, and sodium tends to uh, hold on to water. So if water, uh, if sodium is reabsorbed, then the, it, it will also bring with it water. If sodium is excreted, it will also bring with it water, okay? So the change in your urine volume is, is basically, you know, it's linked. It's not dependent upon, but it is linked to um, the sodium um, adjustments in your body. Either you excreting it or reabsorbing it will affect your water um, intake and output. Okay, uh, water output is slowed through the action of antidiuretic hormone. That's what ADH stands for, right? So when ADH is secreted, which is triggered by the uh, hypothalamus uh, in response to dehydration, this is going to promote reabsorption of water by the kidney. Okay, remember we talked about antidiuretic hormone. So we, 
will reduce the amount of water that is leaving our body if we produce more ADH, which is going to promote water reabsorption in the kidney. There are things called aquaporins. Aquaporins are synthesized in response to antidiuretic hormone. These are membrane proteins uh, in the renal ducts that are channels that will allow water to diffuse back into the renal medulla. So the production of antidiuretic hormone will synthesize aquaporins, which will allow for water reabsorption. That's what those three bullet points say in a, in a nutshell. Okay. However, even though water is being put back into the medulla and back into the kidney being reabsorbed, the sodium is still being excreted. So your osmo, your urine's osmolarity increases, but the body fluid's osmolarity does not. Okay. So that's a good thing, right? So the sodium is released, but the water is being kept. Okay. Um, antidiuretic hormone system is an example of negative feedback, right? So we have negative and positive feedbacks that happen in the body. Okay. Um, what a feedback mechanism is, it's, it's the re, it's the restoration of the, of homeostasis. It's the restoration or bringing back to normal this homeostatic, um, balance. If the osmolarity in your system rises or your blood pressure falls or your blood volume falls, more antidiuretic hormone is secreted and therefore more water should be reabsorbed, therefore decreasing the osmolarity and increasing your blood volume, which should bring you back to normal, right? That, that makes a lot of sense. If osmolarity falls and your blood pressure rises or your blood volume rises, ADH release is stopped. Um, so you don't absorb any more water. Your urine output will increase and these trends are reversed. So it's all about like being on a, um, like a seesaw, right? When your body's out of whack, your body tries to put you back into place. And when your body's back in place, it it's back to normal, right? That's, that's typically how your body works, right? Your body is acting normal, it's in homeostasis, something happens, right? Something happens to cause your osmolarity to rise and your blood pressure and your blood volume to fall. That is going to cause a response from the body. That response is we're going to secrete antidiuretic hormone so that we can uh, reabsorb water, which is going to reduce osmolarity, increase your blood volume and bring you back to normal. And once that happens, the ADH is going to be stopped or the release of ADH will be stopped and your body can be back in homeostasis. Okay, here's a graphic of that happening. So you're dehydrated. That dehydration elevates your blood osmolarity. It stimulates um, receptors of the hypothalamus. It'll produce ADH, make you thirsty, make you ingest water, bring you back to normal. Okay, or it, the same thing will happen. Uh, ADH will be produced. Um, this will slow down um, or cause water reabsorption by the kidney, okay, which will put water back into the system, which brings you back to normal by lowering the osmolarity. Okay. Okay, so let's take a look at some disorders. So that's basically how your body is going to help function uh, with fluid output and intake, things like that. So fluid imbalances occurs. If there is an abnormality of total volume, abnormality of concentration, or a uh, distribution or an abnormality of distribution of fluid among body compartments. So fluid deficiency, fluid output exceeds intake over a long period of time. So what that means is you're going to the bathroom or you're sweating or you're losing liquids uh, more than you're taking in liquids over a period of time. Okay. Uh, what could happen to you if that happens? What could happen if you are losing fluids uh, quicker than you're taking them in? The most serious things that could happen to you is you can go into circulatory shock. The reason for that, what is circulatory shock? That's basically your heart and um, blood vessels not being able to function properly because your blood volume is too low, right? Uh, if you lose too much water, your blood volume will decrease because your blood is made of water. If you lose too much of it, for whatever reason, your body has to steal water from your blood so that your organs work properly. But that in turn is going to cause your circulatory system to suffer and you can go into circulatory shock. Okay, your heart could stop. Okay, you could have neurological dysfunctions. Okay, due to dehydration of brain cells. If your brains are, if your brain cells aren't getting 
uh, the fluids that they need, okay, you can go have some um, neurological issues. Um, and you can also have infant mortality from diarrhea, okay? If, if an infant um, is losing a lot of fluids due to, you know, constant diarrhea uh, for whatever reason, uh, that, that infant can die from dehydration. Okay, you have two types of fluid deficiencies. You can have volume depletion or you can have dehydration. So let's take a look at those individually, okay? Volume de depletion, it's called hypovolmia, okay? And hypovolmia occurs when proportionate amounts of water and sodium are lost without replacing them. Okay, so if you lose water and you don't replace it, you lose salt or sodium and you don't replace it, okay, that is what volume depletion is. Okay, your total body water declines, your TBW will decline, but the osmolarity will remain normal. Okay, you're not necessarily um, going to lose uh, all the sodium necessarily uh, if your total body water declines. Okay, what could this cause? This could, this, what could this be caused by? This could be caused by hemorrhaging. Okay, uh, this could be caused by severe burns. Okay, many times people that have severe burns um, are at risk for hypovolmia, okay, due to um, the loss of water uh, due to those burns. Chronic vomiting, okay, if, you, if you're constantly throwing up, okay, that could uh, cause um, proportionate amounts of water and sodium to be lost. Okay, diarrhea, like we said with the infants, or Addison's disease. Addison's disease is, uh, is categorized by progressive anemia, low blood pressure, uh, great weakness, and is caused by inadequate secretion of hormones in the kidney, in the adrenal cortex of the kidney. Okay, so all of these things uh, could be the reason for hypovolmia. Okay. Dehydration. Um, is a negative fluid balance, which means you you are have you are losing uh, lots of water. Okay, the body eliminates significantly more water than sodium, uh, so the extracellular fluid osmolarity rises. Right, so the water is leaving, but the sodium is staying the same. Okay, what uh, could cause this? Lack of drinking water. That's one way that you can become dehydrated. You do not drink enough water. Um, if you are diabetic, okay, we we talked about diabetes in the in the last. Uh, lectures. Diabetes is any type of disease that's going to stop water reabsorption. So um, different types of diabetes will stop water reabsorption, which means you're going to release water in your urine, which is going to make you dehydrated. Okay. If you overproduce or if you, un I'm sorry, if you underproduce, hypo means underproduce. If you underproduce antidiuretic hormone, okay, antidiuretic hormone promotes um, the reabsorption of water. So if you're not producing that hormone, which is what hyposecretion is, then you are letting water pass without being reabsorbed and you're going to, it's, it's, it's the same basic thing as diabetes, okay, but without the, the pancreatic uh, aspect, right? Diabetes uh, 1 and 2 uh, deal with the pancreas not being able to produce insulin, um, but diabetes insipidus is the uh, lack of production of antidiuretic hormone. You can also become dehydrated if you sweat profusely, okay, without uh, replenishing the water or the overuse of diuretics. Like I said, there were many things like coffee and caffeine and um, diet sodas. These are all diuretics, okay? So if you overuse diuretics and you don't put the water back into your body that you are losing, that could make you dehydrated, okay? Infants are, are more vulnerable to dehydration than adults due to the high metabolic rate uh, that their bodies go through. Their bodies are constantly breaking things down and building things up. So they need lots of water to do that. Um, that demands high urine excretion. Okay. So babies are constantly going to the bathroom. Like every hour or two, they're, they're wetting their diapers because of um, urine excretion. Uh, they have immature kidneys that cannot concentrate urine like an adult kidney. Okay. So water is not going to be reabsorbed as, as good in their, in their kidneys because they are not mature kidneys yet. Okay, and greater uh, ratio of the body surface to volume, uh, which means more evaporation is going to lead or is going to happen in infants um, on a daily basis. Okay, affects all fluid compartments. The intracellular fluid, the blood, uh, and your tissue fluids are all going to be uh, affected compartments. Okay, water loss from sweating. Sweating produced, uh, sweat is produced by capillary filtration. Okay, the blood volume and blood pressure drop when you sweat profusely. Okay, and osmolarity rises once again. Okay, when you lose water but you keep the sodium and you keep the electrolytes, the osmolarity is going to rise. Okay, blood absorbs tissue fluids to replace the loss. 
okay? Um, tissue fluid is going to be pulled from your intracellular fluid, which is going to essentially shrink your cells, right? If you, if you pull water from your cells, you're going to shrivel up your cells, okay? So your blood, your intracellular fluid, and your tissue fluids are all losing water to give you uh, because of your sweating, okay? You're sweating, losing water, so what, your body has to replenish that water somehow. And if you're not drinking it, right, if you're playing a game or if you're, um, you know, doing some type of activity where you're sweating profusely in the heat, and you're not putting water back into you, your body has to take water from somewhere. It needs that water to survive. So it's gonna take it from the blood. It's gonna take it from your cells. It's gonna take it from your tissues. And what you're doing to save one organ system is you're hurting other organ systems, so to speak, okay? And for one liter of sweat, which seems like a lot, right? A one liter bottle of soda is, is, seems like a lot of uh, liquid, okay? But for one liter of sweat, 700 of those milliliters come from your cells and 300 milliliters come from your tissues, okay? So your cells are the things that are really hurting there, okay? And here's a, a diagram of where that, how that water is leaving due to sweat and where that water is being pulled from. You can see the cells. These are what the cells normally look like in, in our picture. And when they lose water, you can see down here, look how shriveled up and flattened they get, okay? It's like if you had a, um, a water balloon with a leak in it, right? This, this would be a nice big full water balloon and then you'd you take some of the, you siphon some of the water out and that balloon shrivels up a little bit, okay? And that's gonna happen so that you can replenish yourself or replenish the water that you've lost due to whatever is causing you to sweat profusely. Okay, cold weather can also uh, throw your fluids out of balance. Okay, in the cold, your skin blood vessels are, are constricted, they shrink, and that's going to raise blood pressure. And when you have high blood pressure, that's going to inhibit your antidiuretic secretion and when you increase, um, when you inhibit the antidiuretic secretion, you're not going to absorb water, okay? This is going to increase the secretion of uh, natriuretic peptides, okay, which are going to essentially uh, make you urinate, okay? And that, ur that urine is going to be um, increased uh, with water, okay? Urine output is increased and blood volume is reduced, right? So your blood volume is going to go down. Your urine output will increase because the water is not being uh, absorbed because the ADH is not being secreted as much. And that's all due to a rise in blood pressure because you were cold, okay? It's like a set of dominoes. One thing affects the next thing, which affects the next thing, which affects the next thing, right? The cold weather is that first domino. That first domino, that cold weather causes your blood vessels to constrict. That uh, restriction in blood flow raises your blood pressure. That raise in blood pressure stops ADH from being secreted, which is going to uh, increase your urine output and decrease your blood volume, right? All because of that first domino, which was the cold weather, okay? Cold air is drier and increases respiratory water loss. I had mentioned that before. If the, if the air is dry around you, okay, the water will kind of be pulled out of you um, <clears throat> by diffusion, okay? Um, so the same thing goes for cold air. Cold air tends to be dry. Okay, if you have ever noticed that your nose gets kind of bloody and, and um, uh, irritated in the wintertime, and that's because the, the cold air tends to have less moisture in it, which means it's drier, okay? And it, it, it does a number on your, on your nasal passages, your nasal membranes, okay? Cold weather respiratory and urinary losses cause a state of reduced blood volume, hypovolemia again. Okay, exercise will dilate your vessels again and uh, in your skeletal muscles. And what happens is insufficient blood for the rest of your body can bring on weakness, fatigue, or fainting, which is called hypovolemic shock, right? So if you start exercising, your blood vessels dilate and your blood is being redistributed from your organs to the rest of your skeletal muscles around your body, um, which could bring on weakness, fatigue, or fainting when you're in cold weather. Okay, fluid excess. Okay, fluid excess is much less common than fluid deficiency, okay? It's much more common to be dehydrated than it is to be overhydrated, is what that says. Okay, your kidneys are very, very good at compensating for excessive intake of water, and the way that your kidneys deal with too much water is it makes you go to the bathroom more, okay? It's pretty much, uh, it's pretty easy, right? If you drink uh, too much water, um, your kidneys will just quicken the, um, the flow rate in the glomerulus, 
and allow for water to exit the body at a much quicker pace because you don't need that much water. So it's just going to um, it, it won't reabsorb it. It'll just let it pass through your um, your urine. OK, two types of fluid excesses that you do encounter, though, you have volume excesses and you have hypotonic hydration, which is water intoxication or a positive fluid balance. And we'll talk about that in a minute. OK, why? Why is that bad? OK, so you can have pulmonary and cerebral edemas and it could lead to death. What edema is, is basically just a buildup of fluid, right? You don't want to have buildup of fluid in your lungs. That's what pulmonary edemas are. And you don't want to have a fluid buildup around your brain. That's what a cerebral edema is. And both of those can lead to death, right? We don't want that. Okay, here is a, a chart that shows the relationship of blood volume to fluid intake. Um, the higher your blood volume on this side, the higher your fluid intake here. Okay, you can see that if you are intake, if you, if you have high blood volume, but low fluid intake, that's a danger, right? If you have high blood volume, but you're, that's due to um, drinking a lot of water, that's fine. That's normal. Okay. It's normal if you drink a lot of water that your blood volume will rise, but it's not normal if you are not drinking a lot of water, but your blood volume is rising, right? So here, like you, you're putting water into the system and that's what causes this, this line to go up nice and tall here, but your body will get rid of that extra water. If you're not putting water into the system and you're retaining water, that's what's going on here. Your, your body's retaining water, but it's not, um, it's not intaking that water. So where's that water coming from, right? That, that fluid buildup is coming from somewhere. Okay. And it's not the intake. So that's not a good thing. Okay. So volume excess. So let's talk about the excess water we have here. So both sodium and water are retained during volume excess. Um, and this is called, this could be caused by renal failure, right? If your kidneys fail, okay, that means that it's not allowing, um, liquids and urine to pass out of the body and, or pass into the bladder and out of the body. Um, and if your kidneys don't work, then this water is, does not leave your body. It gets retained. And so does the salt. So the water is retained, the salt is retained or the sodium is retained. And that could be due to uh, kidney failure. Okay, hypotonic hydration, which is like I said before, water and talk. Oops, sorry, water intoxication. Okay, that's essentially when you when you drink too much water, you, you're you're taking in too much water. Okay, more water than um, is being retained than sodium, um, or more water is being ingested. Okay, this is going to cause the extracellular fluid to become hypotonic, which causes the cells to swell. Okay, not shrink in this in this case. Okay, the cells will will swell up. And that's water retention. Okay, so if you take in more water um, than sodium retained or ingested, that could cause your cells to to swell up. Okay, fluid sequestration. Okay, fluid sequestration is excess accumulation in a particular location. Okay, so I talked about edemas before. Edema is uh, the most common form of this. Uh, accumulation of fluid in the in, uh, interstitial spaces causes swelling. So if you have a pulmonary edema, you're going to have uh, fluid buildup in between the areas of the lungs or in the area of the uh, pulmonary cavity. Okay, if you have it in the cerebral edema, that'll be you know the same thing: fluid accumulation in the the cranial cavity or around the brain, which is not good. Okay, uh, pleural effusion. Okay, uh, several liters of fluid can accumulate in the pleural cavity. Okay, this um, causes of this could include lung infections. Okay, so you don't want um, one one thing that could do this is uh, like a pneumonia, right? A bacterial pneumonia. Uh, and what bacterial pneumonia is, it's an infection in the lung, um, and that infection in the lung could lead to uh, fluid buildup in the lung, which is what a pneumonia is. And uh, that fluid has to be drained or it has to be reabsorbed by the body. Okay, so typically that's what the doctors want. They want to get you on antibiotics to kill the infection and then your body will just reabsorb the fluid uh, normally, okay? Hemorrhages uh, can cause uh, fluid uh, buildup, okay? A hemorrhage is basically internal bleeding, right? And blood that pools in your tissues is lost to your circulation and that fluid is gonna build up in between the tissues uh, where that blood, uh, uh, where that trauma occurred, okay, where that hemorrhage occurred and um, that could put pressure on other organs in the vicinity. Okay. I think that's where we're going to end it for today. So next 
lecture, we will pick up with electrolyte balances and we will learn about all the different electrolytes. We'll talk about sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, and things like that. But until then, I will see you later. If you have any questions or comments, leave them in the comment section. Thanks. See you next time.